Hello, this Dating the Old Testament video is on the book of Psalms. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, the picture there you have is a modern picture of the entrance to Jerusalem from central Israel, where there's a large bridge designed in the shape of the, uh, the lyre which David played, the stringed instrument. It's called the stringed bridge. It's very attractive. And it reflects the reputation that David had as a psalmist who was uh, an author of many of the, the psalms. So this video is about the book of Psalms and when they were written. And first of all, Psalms is different from everybody else because this, it's an anthology. And for one thing, it's really a unit of five different books. That's not any great secret. If you've got an English Bible and you open the book of Psalms up, there's a good chance that at the beginning of the book, it'll say book one, but then after Psalm 41, it'll say book two. And then so you have book two, three, four, and five, and that's how they're uh, set up. On book one, people don't necessarily agree whether that's Psalm one to 41 or two to 41, because Psalm one might be an introduction to the entire collection. Each book ends with a doxology. And then sometimes it says something like amen and amen at the end of the book. Uh, Psalm 72 there at the end of book two actually says the prayers of David, the son of Jesse are ended, even though Psalm 72 itself is a Psalm ascribed to Solomon. So, and then after Psalm 72, some of the, the later Psalms are written by David, but you see, it says that at the end of Psalm 72, because that's the end of book two, it's the end of the book. And the fact that there's five may be something of a match to the five books of the Torah. Now, guidelines for dating the Psalms. We should have no expectation that all the Psalms would be written at the same time. That's actually certainly not true. It wouldn't be true in a church hymn book today. If you've got a hymn book, just open the hymn book and look usually at the bottom of the hymn, there's a description of when it was written, and they will be all from wildly different times. And that's pretty much the same thing that happened with Psalms and the Bible. They're written by different authors and at different times. We should talk about the authors first. The authors are identified in most of the Psalms and it breaks down like this. David is the author of the largest number, uh, 73 Psalms, so that's almost half of them. Uh, Solomon two and Moses one. I've got their names in red because those are three people that we would just by indicating that if those are the authors of the Psalms then we can put a date on the Psalm because they're known to us. Now Asaph was uh, apparently had a musical role at the time of David but the only snag there is that there's a couple Asaphs in the Bible uh, and some of them are a good deal later and also some of the Psalms of Asaph have some indication that they might have been written later. So when it says it's a Psalm of Asaph, we're not really necessarily positive about which one it meant. It may have been kind of a popular name. And the sons of Korah, Korah was a, a Levite who rebelled against Moses, but his sons continued to serve in Levitical roles. And one of the roles was in leading in worship, but that really means that they're descendants of Korah, and so we don't know exactly when that would be. And at the bottom, oh, Ethan the Ezraite, I put an asterisk next to his name because his psalm says it was by him and the sons of Korah. So it leaves about 51 psalms anonymous. Now, first of all, I think we should trust the authorship's attributions. In other words, if the psalm says it was a psalm of David, we ought to believe that it was a Psalm of David. Uh, the, when it says a Psalm of David or something like that at the beginning, those lines are a part of the scripture just like everything else. I realize in an English Bible, those lines are, don't have a verse assigned to them, but they're right there in the scripture with everything else. And 
Jesus and Peter and Paul all seem to trust the authorship attribution to David. Also, the Talmud and 2 Maccabees refer to David writing Psalms. I put 2 Maccabees in there because really that was before at the time of Christ, so that makes it like the earliest witness to the fact that David was an author to Psalms, the earliest witness outside the book of Psalms, that is. In particular, we ought to read this passage in the New Testament. I'll read it. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question saying, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David in the spirit calls him Lord saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? So in that uh, scripture, Jesus is quoting from a psalm that's a psalm of David. And the, the thing here is that if that psalm wasn't really written by David, then Jesus's whole point would be invalid. So not only is it a, the idea that Jesus trusted the inscriptions, he was willing to base the whole argument that he was making there on the fact that this is David who was talking. Oops, let me go forward there. So a little bit more about David. As far as him being a musician, the whole reason he came to Saul's attention in the first place was due to his musical skill. Um, while he was uh, early in his career, he wrote a song of mourning for Saul and Jonathan, it says in the book of Samuel, and then later for Abner, a general in Saul's army. And Amos 6, 5, that's uh, one of the earliest prophets it gives kind of an independent witness to anything outside of, it's not in Psalms, it's not in Samuel. And he's criticizing, making fun of some of the people in Northern Israel and saying, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp and like David invent for themselves instruments of music. So it's kind of a backhanded reference to the fact that David was a musician. Now, in a lot of the Psalms of David, there's an inscription at the beginning, which doesn't just say who the author was, but it gives a little bit of a write up on when the Psalm was written or what the circumstances around it would be. And I wanted to look at one just as an example, because there's a few things that we can learn about it. Psalm seven starts by saying, a Shigayan of David, which he sang to the Lord concerning the words of Cush, a Benjaminite. Okay, now the first thing is, Cush is not known based on First and Second Samuel. So a few people have said that we can't really trust those inscriptions because somebody later on just went through the book of First and Second Samuel and picked out stories about David and said this one sounds like that, but that's clearly not what happened because. There are really about four of these inscriptions which you couldn't exactly get from the book of first and second Samuel. This is one of those. Cush isn't in first and second Samuel. The second thing is you've got this word. This is the Shigayon of David. Well, we don't really know what that means. I think that there may be some Bibles which might translate that as a contemplation or something like that, but uh, this is the English Standard Version, and they didn't translate the word. And the reason that they didn't translate the word is because it was in their judgment, not something they didn't know what it meant. Well, the fact that they don't know what it means, and you know, in the Jewish community, there's not a consensus about what it means either. Uh, the fact that it's unknown is a sort of witness to the antiquity of the psalm. It indicates that it's quite old. Now, a psalm that was written by David would be 1000 BC. So, you know, by the time you've pulled the entire canon of the Old Testament together, it's probably quite a bit after about like 400 BC or something like that. So six, 700 years later. And by that time, some words probably have passed out of usage. And so, you know, by the time that they were trying to understand what this meant, they, they didn't know what a Shigayan was anymore. And that makes sense if it's very old. 
there are other things that are kind of unknown to us from the Psalms too, and, and they're a witness to antiquity too. The most famous one is the word Selah, which appears in a lot of Psalms. And we really don't know what that means. Uh, you probably read it in English, it just says Selah, it's untranslated because we don't know what it means. It might be a kind of musical pause. It might be an acronym that means sign to raise the key signature or something like that. But the truth is we don't know for sure. We also don't know uh, the tunes that any of these are set to. Some of these uh, psalms are indicated that they're supposed to be set to a song like to the lilies or deer of the dawn. And deer of the dawn might have been one of the famous songs back then, but we have no idea how that went. I'd be fascinated to want to know what, what that sounded like, but we don't know. So those are all things that are unknown or lost to us. And that's because the, I think that's evidence that they're old. Now, going back to the story of the books, that Psalms is a collection of five different books. In my judgment, it looks like books one and two are pre-exilic publications. In other words, the book was essentially completed before the Babylonian exile. Book one, uh, the first and second Psalm don't have an attribution, but the next 39 in a row, all the rest of the book one are all uh, Psalms of David. And so all these Psalms look like they're probably written prior to the Babylonian exile of 586 BC. On the other hand, books three to five appear to be post-exilic publications. That doesn't mean that all the Psalms in them are post-exilic, not, not at all. Some of them are, some of them aren't. They're a combination of old and new Psalms. In books three to five, some of those Psalms are actually Psalms of David too. Let's look at a couple later Psalms. An example of an exilic Psalm is kind of obvious. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. So the captives had been taken to Babylon. To, this is the Babylonian exile. This is Psalm 137.1. Or even post-exilic. Now this is not quite as clear as the previous one. But when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Psalm 126. This psalm reads a little bit like a psalm of people after they had returned from exile and they were thankful that it seemed like a dream come true that they were able to, to come back. Or here are some earlier psalms, some of the early ones. Now, a collection of the psalms are called royal psalms because they talk about the king. Well, remember, the king goes away when the Babylonians take over. So royal psalms are all going to be pre-exilic. They would say things like Psalm 2, 4 says, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Sometimes the earlier Psalms have other clues on their date, like look at this one. Talking about a parade into the temple. There is Benjamin, the least of them in the lead, the princes of Judah in their throng, the princes of Zebulun, the princes of Naphtali. Well, Zebulun and Naphtali, that's pretty interesting because they are part of the, they will become part of the northern kingdom of Israel, which is later destroyed, and then there's just Samaria. So the fact that you've got a procession here with northern tribes places this in the time of the united monarchy when there was one common kingdom of Israel and Judah together. And then as, as I went through and looked at the different Psalms, I noticed some tendencies like the Vedic Psalms often have similar themes. One, the one that sticks out the most is enemies. David has got lots of prayers about praying to the Lord for help with his enemies. And that makes sense when you, you know, see the biography of his life and all he had to put up with. That's common in Psalms of David. On the other hand, the Davidic Psalms and other old Psalms never say hallelujah, which is translated praise the Lord. There's plenty of praise in the Psalms, but they don't use that phrase. They do use the phrase 
give thanks to the Lord or give thanks, often in some places where the later Psalms might say, hallelujah. Also, later Psalms never have an introductory inscription, or they also do not have the directions to the choir director that sometimes shows up in the earlier Psalms. So there tends to be some tendencies in the older Psalms and some tendencies in the um, later Psalms. So in conclusion, the Psalms are a collection of Psalms written by different people throughout the biblical period. So it spans a very long period of time. And many of them can be dated with some confidence and for others, it's hard to put a date on them. In my book, Dating the Old Testament, I did try to put a date on each Psalm. And along with putting a date on it, I also put kind of a grade on it because for some, you could be pretty confident about the date, and for others, it was barely better than just a guess. So that's the story on Psalms. Thank you for watching, and I will be back uh, soon, I hope, with another video about another book in the Bible.